So my phone died. I was charged. I thought I was charging it. I thought I had it plugged in. But in fact, I didn't. I had put the cable in entirely. So the phone went off and we lost everyone. So we're continuing. Yeah, that's my, that was my mistake. <laughs> I had a cable plugged in. Unfortunately, I didn't plug it in all the way. So, so I'm going to read this verse again. The last thing I read it's from the Nishringa Purana. Even if one fully engaged in the devotional service of the Lord is sometimes found engaged, engaged in abominable activities, these activities should be considered to be like the spots that resemble the mark of a rabbit on the moon. Such spots do not become an impediment to the diffusion of moonlight. Similarly, the accidental fall down of a devotee from the path of saintly character does not make him abominable. So what Prabhupada is saying, or what this verse is saying, is that you have this devotee who is engaged, he's determined, he's engaged in devotional service. That's his life and soul, and he's done so much service. And then there's a the little blemish because he slips up somewhere. So what this verse is saying, what Nishringa Purana is saying, it has no effect on him. And because it has no effect on him, he can continue going on with his devotional service. And because it has no effect on him, we're supposed to understand that and we're supposed to see it. That, that is only a spot on the moon. It's not a major fault and it doesn't mean he's not a devotee. And yes. When you come in a room and the door is closed, then when you come in and open it, you close it again, right? Well. That's what you should do. Mm. So here this verse is saying what he's done may be considered abominable, but it doesn't make him abominable. So <laughs> can you close the door down there as well? So, you know, if someone does something abominable, then we say he's abominable. And Krishna says, no, he's not, because this is not his normal position. This is an accident. Okay, if that's his normal position, then you can say, yes, this person is abominable. But that's not the point here. The point here is this is not his normal position. This is an accident. His normal position is that he's engaged in devotional service with determination. And so Krishna is saying, and Nishringa Purana is saying, that's what you're supposed to see. You're supposed to see the service. And that little fall down is a blemish which cannot harm his creeper. So I don't think we can overstress this point. That if, if one is determined then a little blemish here and there will have no effect on him. It won't, it won't inhibit his devotional service. And so the key here, as we read yesterday and today, the key here is the devotee's determination and his sincerity and his remorse. Last paragraph. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee in transcendental devotional service can act in all kinds of abominable ways. This verse only refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connections. So Prabhupada's making this point, it's an important point. If I read this verse and it says a devotee is saintly even though he falls down, then one may think, well, if I continually fall down, it doesn't matter because I'm saintly. And Prabhupada's making the point, no. That's not what Krishna's saying. Krishna's saying if it's an accident, Devotional service is more or less a, declar a declaration of war against the illusory energy. As long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusory energy, there may be accidental fall downs. 
But when one is strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall downs as previously explained. Now one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think he is still a devotee. If he does not improve in his character by devotional service, then it is understood that he's not a high devotee. So the, in the commentaries by uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti or Baladev Bidyabhusha on this verse, it describes a devotee who has done something abominable and that devotee is very regretful and very remorseful. He doesn't think, oh, it's not a big deal. He doesn't rationalize it. He is regretful. He acknowledges his mistake. But he's determined to be Krishna conscious. That's a lot different than what Prabhupada is saying here, that uh, somebody could use this verse as a license to commit sin. And saying, I may be committing sin, but I'm a sadhu. That's not <clears throat> what Krishna is saying. This is accidental. So I have some questions. Let's go back. What about devotees who don't change and do the same mistakes over years and want to consider senior devotee and do respectful services? Well, what we just read, I think, describes that. I'll read it again. No one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. If he does not improve in his character, by devotional service, then it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee. I guess that's a polite way of saying he's a low devotee. Or I guess someone may say, is he even a devotee? Devotee is kind of a generous, generous word for someone. Just, oh, well, Prabhupada's being generous. Okay, he's a devotee, he believes in Krishna. But he's a low grade, low grade devotee. Forgive me if I am out of line here, but I often wonder how people like me who are way down dream of achieving a forgiving mindset like you do. How can we do that? We think it is between them and Krishna and nothing for us to think about. Well, if you look at this verse, Krishna is ordering you to see if a devotee is sincere and serious. That is what Krishna is ordering you, ordering you to see. The other thing is, let's say you might say, but he doesn't seem so serious and it doesn't seem like an accidental fall down. It seems like he's committing mistakes all the time. Okay, so let's say for the sake of discussion, that's true, but it doesn't mean he can't improve. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to improve. And I think the thing to understand, which maybe sometimes we don't, is that when we see somebody doing something wrong, we don't always know what's going on internally because the person themselves may realize it's wrong and they may feel it's wrong, but they may feel weak. So sometimes we're condemning someone who's also condemning themselves. And so we think, well, who is this devotee? Think he is, uh, look what he's doing and it seems like he has no conscience, doesn't care. But that may, may not be the case. It may be that he's just weak, he can't control himself, and he's also feeling the way you do about him, that this was very bad, it was very wrong, and I feel bad that I've done it. So that's there also. And then ultimately it's, it's up to Krishna to deal with every one of us according to our actions. So. Krishna orders us to be compassionate, forgiving, and so forth. So that's our duty. As far as punishment, that's his position. You don't have to be in that position. Now, if a devotee is harming other devotees, then we want to protect the other devotees. That is an injunction, that we don't stand by and watch other people suffer. But I think you're referring to things that have already been done that you can't turn the clock back and undo. And I think that maybe the best thing for you is forgive the sin. Uh, we 
we uh, forgive the sinner but not the sin. So we're not saying to not, say, to not admit that what a person did was wrong. We're just saying that there's a difference between the person and what they did. And people can be rectified. And Lord Nityananda's forgiveness is very deep, as we saw with Jagai and Madai. So we, we try to follow in that line of being kind and merciful and giving everyone a chance. Now, if that person is harming other devotees, then that kindness would be counterproductive. Or it would end up perhaps being um, destructive even. So that's different. Prabhupada was very merciful, and no matter what anybody did, if they wanted to rectify themselves, Prabhupada always took them back. Always. The only reason he wouldn't take them back is because they didn't want to follow him. So he had no reason to take them back because he couldn't help them. But as long as they were willing to rectify themselves and surrender, then he could help them, then he would take them back. So. We should follow Prabhupada's example, right? Yes. What kind of all wrong did they may come across with any sincerity who is following them? What do you mean? What is Krishna referring to in this verse? What kind of fall down is Krishna referring to? Any kind of fall down. Mistake can be committed. Any kind of mistake. And 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 then what? I'm not sure what you're asking. We should see them as a sadhu no matter what mistake they made? Is that what you're asking? Well, you know, that's the general idea that Krishna's giving, but there may be practical consideration that a person is socially dangerous and destructive and continually committing the mistake. So, you know, there may be exceptions to the rule. You know, he killed somebody. Generally, a sadhu wouldn't kill somebody. So, Prabhupada's saying here, something which is socially or morally unacceptable. Doesn't sound like rape, doesn't sound like, doesn't sound like a serial killer, a serial rapist. He's talking about an accidental fall down. And if, if as is described here, the devotee is sincere and determined, then What's described here does not sound like a major sin. As Prabhupada saying, socially or morally in the eyes of the public, it wasn't right. He doesn't get specific. But I think we can assume it's not something that someone would be locked up for as dangerous. If a person is dangerous, then they're practical considerations. But this poses another question, and this question comes up often. If somebody does something for which they've been banned from coming to a temple or restricted in some way, and the question is, well, how long do you restrict them? When does the forgiveness kick in? Or is there never forgiveness? Or is there forgiveness, but you restrict them to protect others? So these are... These are practical questions that you have to deal with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You want to protect the devotees. At the same time, the principle of forgiveness and mercy is, it also has to be there. And forgiveness and mercy towards the people this person hurt as well. And forgiveness and mercy towards him, so. Prabhupada's not being specific here. Maybe in the commentaries they're more specific. There are verses in which it explains how the holy name purifies the most sinful person, the rapist, the murderers, uh, adulterers, adulterers, yeah, just everybody. So we understand that, that if the person is willing to be rectified, they, they can be rectified, and, and that's... It's a key ingredient in this verse. It's their willingness to be rectified, and that's what we're supposed to see more than anything. But, okay, you can see him as a sadhu, but maybe you don't want to invite him to your house because you don't trust him, because he stole something from your friend, 
all right, he regrets it, but I don't trust him. So, you know, these are practical considerations. But philosophically, Krishna's saying, see him as a sadhu because he's a devotee. Okay, sadhu, great. I'm not inviting you over to my house. I uh, value my possessions, I don't, and I don't trust you. Okay, that might be there. You know, the key phrase here is accidental. It happened due to conditioning. It's not a constant thing. And that can happen. It happens to very great devotees. Sometimes they give in to the pushings of the senses, circumstantially. It's not a constant thing. Mm. Let's read the next verse. We have a little time. This is verse 31. Chipram bhavati dharmadma shashras chantim nigachchati konteya pratijanihi name bhakta pranasyati. He quickly becomes righteous and attains a lasting peace. O son of Kunti declared boldly that my devotee never perishes. So the qualification that's being described in the previous verse is remorse and determination to succeed. So the next verse Krishna is saying, if he has these qualities, he's remorseful and he's determined, then dharmatma, chipram bhavati dharmatma, soon he'll become righteous, he'll become pure. So if he's on the path to becoming pure, we should not condemn him. Let's read it. This should not be misunderstood. In the seventh chapter, the Lord says, one who is engaged in mischievous activities cannot become a devotee. One who is not a devotee of the Lord has no good qualifications whatsoever. The question remains then, how can a person engaged in abominable activities, either by accident or even by intention, be a pure devotee? This question may justly be raised. The miscreants, as stated in the seventh chapter, who never come to devotional service have no good qualifications, as stated in the Bhagavatam. Generally, a devotee who is engaged in the nine kinds of devotional activities is engaged in the process of cleansing all material contamination from the heart. He puts the Supreme Personality of God within his heart, within his heart, and all sinful contaminations are naturally washed away. Continuous thinking of the Supreme Lord makes him pure by nature. According to the Vedas, there is a certain regulation that if one falls down from his exalted position, he has to undergo certain ritualistic processes to purify himself. But here there is no such condition because the purifying process is already there in the heart. So this is interesting. You know, like you commit some sin and then you do some atonement to get purified. So Prabhupada's saying, a devotee, he doesn't have to do that because his remorse is his purification. And if he's remorseful, he gets purified and then soon he becomes a sadhu, a saint. He puts the personality of Godhead within his heart and all sinful contaminations are washed away. Continuous thinking of the Supreme makes him pure by nature. According to the Vedas, there's a regulation if one falls down from his position, he has to undergo certain ritualistic processes. But here there's no such condition because the purifying process is already there in the heart of the devotee due to remembering the Supreme Personality of Godhead constantly. Therefore, the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, should be continued without stoppage. This will protect the devotee from all accidental fall downs. He will thus remain perpetually free from all material contamination. So, the indication here is that the devotee is sincere, he has an accidental fall down, he's determined, this is a matter of time before he becomes pure. So, he's He's going to become pure, so don't criticize him. He's samyag vipastito, he's, he's properly situated. He just, he just had a little accident. But the reason, I mean, what Krishna is saying here, he's saying this is how we should see it. 
in another person. But the reason I decided to do this verse is because I think we also need to see ourselves in this way. Because yesterday we talked about how discouraged we can become, how we can beat ourselves up when we are not, we, we fall short of perfection. And though Krishna is saying here, no, it's not a big thing. You slip up here or there, it's not a big thing. If you want to be, if you're sincerely trying to be a devotee, that's what's most important. So if you're a sincere devotee, then you can think like this also. That I may slip, but I'm sincere. And Krishna sees me as a sadhu, and I should see myself as a sadhu. And I shouldn't become depressed or discouraged. So you have any questions? We see the sincerity, yeah. Give them another chance, another choice. If a devotee harming community, not feeling guilty with their behavior, if he or she should be condemned by the community, this person doesn't want to rectify. The the general principle, because I don't know the situation, but the general principle is that if a devotee is harming others, then we have to do something to protect others who are being harmed. You know the saying, you know, you sacrifice a person to save a village. So the point that Krishna is making here is general. If we get specific, that, okay, maybe this person is, is weak and having accidental fall downs, but the problem is, it's disturbing or harming others. So yeah, then we have to take practical action. And it may be unhealthy for that person to be associating with devotees. It may be dangerous. That is a consideration. And then the local management will deal with that accordingly. So we want to be merciful, but not so merciful that other people become affected. At least I know for myself, it's a policy I have. I, I'm patient and kind and sympathetic with devotees, but if their actions are disturbing other devotees, then it's like, okay. Then we can't allow you in the Sangha if you're going to disturb the Sangha. Because in the name of mercy, now everyone's being disturbed. So we have to protect the devotees. I think that's important. I've seen devotees get very disturbed by individuals who are problematic, irresponsible, they blame others and so forth. And so everyone gets disturbed by them. And if that's the case, then we may have to restrict that devotee's association. That's a difficult call, and that's a call individual leaders will have to make. It's the duty of the leader to protect his devotees, protect the community. Well, let's give a simple example. So let's say there's someone, devotee, non-devotee, who comes to the temple and they're criticizing Prabhupada. And you can't stop them from criticizing. You would probably say, if you can't stop criticizing, we can't allow you to come. Because that criticism is polluting the environment, and it's offending everyone. So that's simple, right? That, that we, we would know that in a situation like that, we may want to restrict that person, right? So, so there may be other situations in which a person is disturbing the environment, and they would have to be restricted. It's kind of a balance of mercy and practicality. And I, I've been in many situations like this where I try to be merciful to, to a devotee, to help a devotee, but that devotee was disturbing the other devotees. And everyone would say, why are you being merciful to that devotee? That devotee just, just, that devotee just disturbs everybody. So sometimes that's a, a problem. And uh, in this situation, I gave deference to the body of devotees and I had to distance from this devotee. 
devotee never did anything to bother or disturb me, but the devotee did something to disturb the devotees, and they were um, constantly complaining, and it was very difficult to deal with the devotee, and the, the devotee didn't want to take help from them, so I had to just distance and separate. But it doesn't mean that devotee can't become better. That's also there. You know, when we were teaching the forgiveness course, so you have this issue with somebody, and in 10 years later, you still have the issue, but it doesn't mean that over the last 10 years they didn't change. You know, we tend to think, no, how it was 10 years ago is how it is now. They may have changed entirely. They have been regretful. I told the story that um, I was offended by this devotee. I don't say offended, betrayed. And that devotee left after betraying me and then I didn't see him for 23 years. And when he saw me, he said, please forgive me, I know I betrayed you. So then I thought he probably knew the day he left, he betrayed me and he betrayed other leaders. But I was feeling betrayed. But if I would have known that he felt that he was aware of it, I probably wouldn't have felt betrayed. So you don't always know what the person who's doing the so-called abominable action is going through in their own consciousness. So you may be condemning them for something and they're condemning themselves for the same thing. They're fully aware of it. So that's something else you can add into the equation. But if, if as you're saying, there's no remorse, and there's no improvement, then, uh, then what Prabhupada is saying is that we see that situation differently. It's not the same as someone who's remorseful and improving. Because we all make mistakes. You know what we say. If you harm someone, certainly you'd want to be forgiven. So if that's true, then why shouldn't you forgive someone who harms you? Right? No, I want to be forgiven, but I don't want to forgive them. That doesn't make sense, does it? I want mercy, but I don't want to give mercy. No, it doesn't work like that. Mm. Any other questions? But again, we're emphasizing, I, I brought this verse up to emphasize that it's interesting that Krishna is talking about accidental fall down. And it's interesting, we read 11 yesterday, 11 Canto, 20th chapter, text 27, 28, how it talks about the devotee falling down. It talks about the devotee having difficulty. And so what do we understand from that? We understand that that's common. If it wasn't common, why would Krishna talk about it? It has to be common, right? That's why he talks about it. So sometimes we have difficulty and I always want devotees to know it's not uncommon to have difficulty. It's not uncommon to accidentally slip. It's going to happen. But what happens after is going to determine is going to determine where you how you're going to progress in Krishna consciousness. So if Krishna is saying it happens then we can know it's pretty much a universal phenomenon. And if Krishna is saying he's considered a sadhu because he's remorseful, then if you're remorseful and you've fallen down, don't, don't berate yourself. Because Krishna considers you his devotee. And Krishna understands. And Krishna's happy when you get up after you fall then Krishna sees, yes, he's determined. He's my devotee. You know, a lot of times after a fall or, or a mistake, we become discouraged. But at that point, you can show Krishna your determination and Krishna will then shower his mercy. 
So you can, you can say it's an opportunity to show determination. Because it takes more determination after you do something wrong, doesn't it? Okay, I, it's like you're running a race and you slip and fall and you hurt yourself and you get up and you just, I'm not going to give up, I'm going to keep running. Keep running. Well, there's a chance you could win the race if you keep running. So really, this verse 930 really puts emphasis on determination. Utsaha nisteya dharya enthusiasm, patience, determination, really emphasizes determination as a key ingredient. And determination means sometimes you have, like you can't even find a reason to go on. Everything is so bad, everything is so discouraging, you can't even find a reason. That's determination, that even there's no reason you can't give up your bhakti. It's not possible. You can't give it up. That's Krishna consciousness. Yes? What has sometimes what happens is that uh, a small fall down may trigger the seeds of fall down. Say that again. A small fall down? May trigger. A bigger fall down. Yeah. And like, you know, you are on the beam, you slip from there. By the time you realize you are on the floor. Yeah, so that's why in the in the in 9:30, Prabhupada was getting beginning the purport. I don't know if you were here when we were reading that. Were you here when we were reading the pur purport to 9:30? Uh, I don't think you were here. So in the purport, Prabhupada was saying the devotee has to be very careful to maintain his realizations in Krishna consciousness. It has to be very... I'll read it to you. I think it'll answer your question. It's from 9.30. I think it's the first paragraph. As far as possible, Vodhi is very cautious so that he does not do anything that could disrupt his wholesome condition. He knows that perfection in his activities depends on his progressive realization of Krishna consciousness. Hmm. So he's cautious. So I slip, right? You're walking somewhere and you slip. Now you're cautious. It's slippery here. Not that you slip and then you just keep slipping. So Prabhupada uses the word cautious. A devotee is cautious so that he does not do anything that could disrupt his wholesome condition. You know, when you're not cautious, then you have trouble. And then if you're not cautious, then I would question, why is it you're not cautious? What's wrong? Have you, have you given up? And if you say you slip a little, it's easy to slip more. That may be true, but you're allowing yourself to slip. So that's the beauty that nobody can make you slip. That's a conscious choice. You may say, no, it's the modes of nature. Okay, maybe it's the modes of nature, but you made choices in your life that now have allowed you to be affected by the modes of nature. So even if you say the modes of nature are controlling me, then I would say, yeah, but you put yourself under their control. So when we are talking about accidental mistake, so again it is a conscious choice only. No, it's not a conscious choice. It's but actually you know, one may say that you know, this is accidental and I was under the influence of yeah. That's why it is an accident. It was not my conscious choice. Of course. I mean, if you want to speak psychologically, you, you could say, yeah, it was your choice. But the way Prabhupada's referring to it, he uses the word accidental. 
And so my understanding is that accidental means rare. And it means you're in an environment where your weakness is being tempted. And you're not, at that point, you're having a difficult time controlling yourself because it's something you're so conditioned to do. Of course, you could say, yes, you could control yourself. But Prabhupada's giving the benefit of the doubt that this was circumstantially virtually impossible to control. But it was also rare. So it's not common. And I think that's a distinguishing factor. If it's common, then yeah, it's just an excuse. And then I wouldn't say it's accidental. So, so what Krishna and Prabhupada are talking about here is re it's really real life, that accidents happen. You know, you're, you're caught somewhere in a situation in a weak moment and then you snap. And you do something that you thought you would never do. So that can happen. In lower stages, in higher stages, it's not going to happen. Once you're in Nishta, that's not going to happen. Even maybe in Artha it would be more rare. And Ruchi, forget it. Getting discouraged, disappointment, all these are uh, an instrument of your mind. How they enter the world. Say the, say, say the first part, I didn't hear. Depression and discouragement. Oh yeah, yeah, it's Maya. Definitely. One of the big weapons of Maya, discouragement. One of the big weapons against Maya, enthusiasm. Nobody can stop it, an enthusiastic devotee. Utsahan, nishtayad dharyat. Enthusiasm, patience, confidence, determination. I will be Krishna conscious. These are the qualities, nectar of instruction, these are the qualities that preceded to give you bhakti. And the other verses, pranashati, destroy bhakti, atyahara payasascha, and so forth. So we have to look at those verses. And sometimes we fall into those qualities which are destructive to bhakti by our conditioned nature. We have to stop ourselves and then push ourselves into utsahan, enthusiasm and so forth. Even we may not feel it, we have to push ourselves into it. Otherwise, what's the point of that verse? You can't say, well, I don't feel like being enthusiastic. No, but you have to be, because that's the injunction. This is what gives you bhakti, enthusiasm and patience, sadhu sangha and so forth. So even if you don't feel like it, you have to do it. And that you can do. And so, what I see in this verse is this idea that I may be weak from time to time, but I still can maintain my determination. I don't, I don't have to lose my determination because of my weakness. And which is, a, it's kind of, for most of us, that's logic, it's like subconsciously logical. If I make mistake, I lose enthusiasm. And Krishna is almost, it's almost like Krishna is saying, look at if you have an ex accidental fall down, it's okay. As long as you're remorseful and you go on, you don't worry about it. But we worry about it. And that's why I was bringing this verse up. I said, don't worry about it. Krishna's not worried about it. Why should you be worried about it? Just be worried about getting back up and doing what you have to do. Right? Good? Okay.
All right, so we'll see you all tomorrow at 7. We're going to do the last five verses of Isopanishad for the Bhakti Shastri course. That will be from 7 to 9 a.m. Indian time, which is not a... I don't know if that's a bad time for America. I think it's a decent time. Um, not a good time for Europe. It's 2 a.m., I think, in Europe. But it will be an okay time in the U.S. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.